Well, I shared with you a little bit of background about uh, this work and why it's of interest to me. Uh, a little bit about uh, of an overview about our approach uh, to, to, to our efforts and contributing to this area of linking the uh, vineyard site to the, to the characterization of the vineyard site to the chemistry and sensory of the finished wine. I'll share a little bit of data that we've uh, collected thus far and analyzed thus far on the volatile compounds and elemental profiles of these wines. And because this work is really just starting uh, with last year's vintage, I'll share a little bit about uh, the details about other work that's in progress right now, as well as other things that we have planned. So the first thing I want to point out is that I'm a chemical engineer by background. I'm not a soil scientist, I'm not a geologist. And so for the past eight or so years, I've actually spent most of my efforts in, in the fuels and chemicals industry where I've worked on catalysts, solid materials for converting uh, fossil fuels into uh, chemicals and transportation fuels. And so a lot of this work uh, that I've focused on has really been in the area of trying to link the, the structure of these materials to their function. And so I put up here just a couple of simple definitions, but these materials are generally not uniform, especially once you start to scale up these processes from uh, bench scale to commercial scale. And so it's a, a great interest in, this in, in that industry to better understand these materials, better characterize these materials, and understand uh, the contributions of the features of these materials and the finished uh, products that they are used for in those processes. And so for me, this was quite similar to a lot of the interest in understanding the, the features of a very complex sites, of vineyards, and the contributions that they have to the finished wine. So in, in this interest in linking uh, vineyard site to wine, some of the challenges that uh, all of us face are there are these operations that are, that are uh, in between these two ends and in, in, in our book and uh, linking the characteristics of site and wine. And so on these sites, we plant a grapevine that convert the raw materials on the site from the atmosphere and from the soil. They produce very nice berries, hopefully, that we eventually convert into wine through a winemaking process. And so often we are challenged with uh, the, the variation in the grapevine and the variation in the winemaking practices. And, and this is one of the things that we hope to uh, control to a greater degree and the efforts that we have underway right now. Uh, these efforts are, are also informed uh, by uh, my, my position right now at UC Davis. My predecessors have been quite interested in this for many, many years, going back to some of the first grapevine, grapevines being planted at Davis in the 1880s. And I just want to point out a couple of things here that uh, I think are probably not quite apparent to everyone here, but are not always trivial uh, to really accomplish in practice. The first was even back in the early days for us in California, they were noting that you need to do these experiments for multiple vintages. I know in talking with my colleagues, it's been very difficult for them to, to sustain any project for more than one vintage. Two becomes a very small uh, uh, percentage, and, and three is, is, is probably non-existent for them even, uh, even on our campus. But I just want to point that out because this is one of the, the things that we are doing with this project is uh, we have a commitment to, to make wine for at least five vintages. And this early work helped very simply divide uh, the state into a couple of climatic regions. And of course, at this point in the early 1900s, uh, research funding uh, and interest in this area was diminishing as we were approaching prohibition and entering prohibition. But quickly after we came out of prohibition, uh, Winkler and Ameren started conducting more experiments. They were analyzing data from pre-prohibition experiments <coughs> and were publishing reports that essentially then came up with these five uh, climatic regions that we all know of the, as the Winkler regions. And now uh, the researchers were becoming more familiar with the state. They were starting to really appreciate the, the rich and distinct uh, diversity that we had even within California. And one last point that I want to pull out from, from their notes is, is that you know they were recognizing that really what they were doing was not necessarily uh, a dramatically different goal than their predecessors had, but had. But what they were really looking uh, to accomplish was to be more strict in their biological controls 
and to be more thorough and complete with the chemical analyses and the organoelectric organoelectric text that were now available to them uh, some 50 years later. And that, again, is another theme, I think, of the, the work that we have uh, started uh, with this project. I just want to acknowledge that we, of course, know that we're expecting to see differences across many of these sites. So here I'm just going to briefly point out some work that uh, was collected uh, and completed by Thomas Fitzpatrick of Aloro during his master's thesis at Davis. Hopefully you got to meet him last night. Yeah. And so this here was uh, just a quick example of California Pinot Noir. Uh, the project that I have going on is, is, is focused on Pinot Noir from the West Coast. But I just want to point out here that uh, when he was collecting samples, uh, this was at press. So we had the anthocyanin concentrations of Pinot Noirs from a number of different wineries uh, and vineyards uh, collected across California. And we're, we just have a total anthocyanin concentration uh, as an algorithm to glucoside equivalents. And so he plotted this just as a rank order here from the most to the least. And coming out of the press, we see a difference uh, throughout California of about a two and a half. And even 120 days later, we see some variability. Again, this could be a result of winemaking practices. Uh, and so forth, but we still see about a factor uh, of two and a half here, going from under 200 to more than 400 uh, milligrams per year of uh, equivalent. So we know that we can see differences across many different sites and money making practices. And uh, one more quick example to bring it now a little closer to home. Uh, this was data, also both of these sets of data were coming out of the lab of Doug Adams uh, at UC Davis. This was collected by uh, Ryan Hodgins. Uh, and he was uh, doing some work with Oregon Pinot Noir. So the time frame of this, the, the thesis was completed in 2004. And here we have some of the tannin data from the sub applications uh, tannin of Atlanta Valley. And so this work was being collected Around the same time, people were putting together all of these application packages that were coming through uh, with the ADAs uh, just a couple of years later. And the one, just one quick thing I want to point out here was uh, when we went to McMenzel and we were tasting some of the wines, maybe you noticed some of the had, had a little bit more of a drying sensation in your mouth, a little bit uh, more astringent. And so that was one of the unique things that they were noting with the small sample size back at that time. Uh, still not a lot of range there right now. Uh, but they were having quite, quite uh, a range of tannins with a very high maximum tannin of about 900 milligrams per year of African equivalents. And so that was, say, more than twice as much uh, as the maximum that was observed in the Shehala Mountains. And so, again, some very uh, distinct differences. But one of the challenges, even with this work, uh, was you know what are what are these differences can be attributed to the vintage site and not to the winemaking, not to the clone, or to the vintage. And so more recently there's there's predominantly been work not done in California uh, with Pinot Noir, but uh, in New Zealand and Oregon. Uh, also most of the data has been collected either at, through commercial lines or through experiments at commercial facilities. And more recently, with the uh, advent of uh, some newer GCMS techniques, we are starting to be able to characterize these wines, uh, their plastic volatile compounds, as well as their sensory characteristics. So some of the things that we're hoping to address uh, with this project is using a single clone of Pinot Noir. Uh, we're using a standard one <laughs> protocol, about 200 liter fermentations uh, at UC Davis campus. So all of this wine, uh, all of the fruit is coming onto campus. We're we are working to do this for several vintages, at least five, so we can dissect uh, and, and see what's a vintage to vintage variation versus what's the true characteristic of, of that vineyard. And maybe there's some vintage to vintage character uh, change that actually we, we see repeated depending on what the vintage is. This is giving us a, an opportunity to analyze wines as they age, both from a chemistry and sensory standpoint, and not necessarily within the first year. And we also aim to not only characterize these wines uh, more thoroughly than uh, we've been able to do, but we're also looking to characterize the vineyard sites more thoroughly than have typically been uh, published as well. And again, so this is coming back to that, that, that quote that I placed up early, earlier, and that what uh, 
what we're really hoping to do is to apply more strict biological controls uh, than have been possible previously. And again, these are not necessarily always trivial things to do, and to be more complete uh, with some of our chemical and sensory and venue characterizations, primarily because these technologies have been uh, coming to us over the past number of years. So just a quick highlight of, of what, what this uh, project is looking like. So we have a number of different vineyard sites uh, across the wide range of American viticultural areas, from the Willamette Valley uh, south through uh, Santa Maria Valley and Santa Maria Hills, and I'll show a map next. The goal here is to have a single clone of Pinot Noir on a single rootstock and make wine from these, the same wines on these same vineyards for at least five years. <coughs> and uh, make the wine under repeatable winemaking conditions, not, not only within uh, a single vintage when these wines are coming in over the course of a month, but also being able to make wines very similarly in the fifth year as we did in the first year. So for those not too familiar with the West Coast uh, of the United States, I wanted to put up a couple of maps here. We'll start here on the right, where we are in the Willamette Valley. We have two vineyard sites. Uh, neither of these are from the sites that we visited thus far. We're in Neanderthal, Carlton, and the Yola, Amity Hills. Just want to point out that I think generously these two sites are about 40 kilometers apart. I think they're probably a little bit closer. Uh, now if we move to California, we're up and down the west coast here. From Santa Maria to Anderson Valley, we're spanning about 650 kilometers, so that's approximately the distance between Bordeaux and, and Dijon in France. Uh, and again, this is kind of the north the south. Uh, and then if you look at the entire distance between all of these sites, they span about 1,400 kilometers, so quite a wide range of sites. Uh, they range from sea level up to uh, approximately six or 700 meters in, in elevation. And qualitatively, just to kind of a quick look at these sites, Santa Rita Hills is the very far south site, very close to the coast, very cool climate, one of the last uh, uh, vineyards that was harvested nearby, you know, probably again about 40 kilometers distance to Santa Maria Valley. We have a couple of sites that are on the bench line there. Again, above uh, some very nice uh, valley floor where they uh, grow lettuce and berries and so forth. Arroyo Seco is, is quite similar to that, uh, just south of San Francisco. So in Nova Coast, we have a lot of diversity here, uh, very different uh, terrains uh, and so forth. This is where we all, so Santa Rita Hills is about 1,000 or 300 meters above, above <coughs> sea level. We have one site on uh, the same elevation here on the true Sonoma coast. Uh, and then this site here is kind of